beginning and no end. You're my hope and my defense. You came to see and save the lost. You paid it all. stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken, you have saved me, it is written, Christ is risen, Jesus you are Lord of all. Morning Clear Creek. Man, I'm so glad you're here. Because if you weren't, I'd be by myself. It is so great to be here with you this morning, and I tell you what, that last song, you guys just really raised the rafters. Thank you. I, just, I feel like God has been praised uh, already this morning, and, and we're excited about how God's going to work through this congregation and work through you and in your lives. There's a lot of great things going on at Clear Creek, and, and we hope that you'll want to be a part of some of those great things happening. The thing that always uh, gets me excited is when families want to come and lock arms with the Clear Creek family and be a part of the mission that we have here of connecting people to God and to each other. And so this morning, I want to welcome a family here, uh, Randall and Carlotta Farley. If they're here, if you can stand up. I know they're here. There we go. Randall and Carlotta are semi-newlyweds. They've been married a little while, but they hadn't been married all that long. Uh, they are a wonderful uh, couple. We're so glad that you're here. I can't wait to see what God's going to do. And I just want to say welcome home. Welcome home. We're glad that you're a part of this congregation. I want to encourage everyone to be here next week. Uh, we're going to uh, have a theme Sunday. Uh, we are encouraging you to wear your team gear, whatever your team gear is, uh, whether it's a, a college team or a pro team. Next Sunday is Super Bowl Sunday, which in my book is like the second most important holiday of the year. And so next week, come in your team gear. Uh, you will be participating just by wearing your team gear in the sermon Sunday morning and entitled, Grab Your Gear. I wanted to say that clearly. Last week I had someone ask me if I said, grab your beer. And, and I did not. Uh, grab your gear. That will be next Sunday morning. We also want you to, to come uh, for the adult Bible class. All the adult Bible classes will be in the worship center. We're going to have what we're calling a pep rally. We're going to talk about all the cool things that happened in 2012, relive a little of that, and we're going to share a game plan for 2013. So, man, come and be a part of this whole day starting at 930 with the pep rally for our adults. And then after that, we're going to do a lesson and a, and a service called Grab Your Gear. So we'll hope Hope you'll want to be a part of that. I, I was also told to say, if you want to wear your tie, you can wear that too, but I won't be. So anyway, before we begin our lesson this morning, though, let's bow together in prayer. God, you're an awesome God, and we are so thankful for the opportunity we have to worship you this morning. You're an amazing God, and we come before you this morning very, very aware that without you, we're nothing, but with you, we can become all things. Lord, you've called us to do amazing things in this life, and our prayer is that we'll be people who will answer that call. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And amen. I felt desperate. Terrified. It was lonely. It was chaos. Such a disaster. And is this it? Is this who I am? Why am I the one who has to be different? The video I just showed is a prologue into a website called IamSecond.com. And IamSecond.com is a website that celebrates uh, people, some famous, some not, who have uh, gone through a life-changing metamorphosis in their life. Uh, and they have found Christ in some very unique ways. I encourage you to go look and look at some of the, the stories on that as well. But the real crux behind that is that people are just people. 
And we're all in need of a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's all we are. And this morning, as I continue in the last segment of our uh, series called Built Strong, that we're to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might, and that's who the church is supposed to be. And anyway, every week we read Ephesians 6, 10. Be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. That's who we're called to be, and it's an amazing calling that we have. And I've been using these boxes every week, and I want to continue to use these boxes today to kind of describe the rules of engagement and where we go from here. You see, we've talked the first week about what is church. And we recognize that church is something that's organic. It, it, it talks about it as a building, but it's not really a building. It's this building that never ends. And it's created of, of flesh and blood, of people who on this earth have, have received that calling from Jesus Christ uh, to live their lives measured by his measure, by Jesus Christ. And that we continue to grow that church person to person, mouth to mouth, ear to ear, nose to nose, toes to toes, and we continue to reach out to people in a very organic way. And the church continues to grow and adds these stones to this imaginary building. The next question that we asked was not only is what is the church, but who is the church for? And that's what we're talking about outward. Outward is looking outward for those who need to hear God's big story of a big love for regular people. You know, the church is for not just church people, but the church is for everybody. And we need to be people who are willing to bring everybody. And we need to look for opportunities to bring everybody in this life-changing relationship with Jesus. And so today it leads us up to, well, what are the rules of engagement? Now, if you haven't been before, I want to explain the boxes very briefly, and we're going to go into this uh, pretty quickly. Uh, on election night, Britt Hume with ABC News stated that the number of people who are claiming their church home, affiliation with the church, had dropped from 25% to 20%. Meaning that 80% of people are either de-churched, meaning that they used to go to church, but they don't go to church anymore, or they're people who have never really been a part of any church family. And so I represented this with these boxes. This red box represents the people who are, are part of a church family, who are, are part of church. Uh, this not, not church building, church meetings, but part of this gathering and organic group that is a revolution in our community and has been a revolution in the world. This is your 20%. These are the people in church. The rest of these represent either de-churched, which has got the yellow lines on the bottom, or people who have never been a part of church. And this morning I want to kind of let you know who these people are. The first group of people I want to talk about are what I'm going to call content atheists. Now, what a content atheist is is someone who does not believe at all that there is a God, and they're good with that. Life's been good. They've had no problems, and they're okay with the idea that they, they're born, they live, they die, they rot, and it's over. Okay? There's another group that we're going to call wary agnostics. And I don't know if you've ever heard the term agnostic, but the word agnostic means this. It means, I don't know. And so someone who claims religiously to be an agnostic, what they're saying is, I haven't made up my mind. I don't, I don't know that there is a God, but I'm leaning toward the evidence that there is not. Because they have not seen enough evidence to say, yes, there really is a God. And so they're kind of wary of the church. They're looking at the church, and they're looking at us, telling them this big story of a big love for everybody. And they're saying, I don't know. They need more information. So, and then we got another group of people that are broken skeptics. These are people who have lived their life and they know something's wrong. They've got a hole in their heart and they don't know how to fill it. And they're going through life and they're, they're, they're saying to themselves, if I could quote an imaginary conversation, life's just not working, but I don't know how to fix it. And I'm not sure that anybody in this red box knows either. So we'll just call them broken skeptics. And then you find the people in this group, which is the de-churched, and we're going to call them cynical seekers. Now here's why I call them that. Most of these people have left a group. They've left the red box. Now, they believe in God, or they have believed in God at some point in their life. 
and they recognize the need for God in their life. The problem is, is they're very cynical about whether or not this is the way to come in contact with him. Okay, you follow me so far, shake your heads. Here's what I want you to realize. If you look at these boxes, from top to bottom, this is the most likely to reach. These are the least likely to reach. Now, do you believe that if we share this story, if we're outward and we share this story of looking outward for those who need to hear God's big story of his big love for everybody, do you think that everybody will respond to that story? No, probably not. Our job, as this box, is to reach out and to do whatever we can to reach as many of these as possible. Now, the Apostle Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22. He writes these words, I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means, look at the word, save some. We're not going to get them all. But what we are going to do is we're going to reach some. So, if we've been called to this great commission, this Matthew 28 commission that we, we find in Scripture, where we're going to all the world and making disciples of all men, baptize them, teach them to deserve all that I've commanded you, if we're really going to do that, and our opportunity and our job in doing that is to reach into this black box, let's remember that we will reach some. We won't reach all of them. But in order to reach into this, we must engage these people. So what are the rules of engagement? How, how do we go about as people in this box to reach these folks and bring them with us? You know, what we do here is we bring people into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. We do it a lot of different ways, but that's all we do. And one of the ways, or kind of the way we do it is we connect people with God and each other. But what are the rules of engagement? How do we engage these people in order to bring them into that relationship and to help connect them? And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. There's three things. They'll be very quick. I'll leave you with them, and then you can think them over. Watch them on YouTube again later in the week and, and, and make notes and think about how this can affect you and apply to you. And rule of engagement number one, we have to have an intentional method. Now, if you aim at nothing you will hit it with remarkable accuracy, right? You've heard that before. If you plan to fail, or you fail to plan, you plan to fail, right? And you're saying, well, wait a minute, the Holy Spirit is going to work in this situation, and, and, and we're just going to go out there, and we're going to spread the seed, and the Holy Spirit's going to work. Well, Jesus told a parable of, sow, of, of the sower, where he sowed in good ground, and he sowed in other ground. Now, we're to sow everywhere we go. But there was also an intentional method that went along with sowing the seed. Now, inside the red box, when we start talking about having an intentional method, let me just throw a couple of things out there and we'll move on. What can we do as a group? What can we do as, as God's gathering in order to have an intentional method to reach into these boxes? And I'm talking about what we do here, what we do amongst ourselves. First thing I want you to think about this, make room. Make room. That means when you see someone that you don't know, say hello. If you see someone who's different from you, engage them. Make room. And the other thing I want to ask you to do, number two, is to realize that there is a huge difference between embracing someone and tolerating someone. You know, there, there are people, there are churches that say, well, we welcome everyone to our church, and, and they do. But they do not embrace everyone in spite of their differences. You know, the real church, the real gathering, was intended to make, be made up of all kinds of people. And if we want to be intentional in our method, it has to start with this. Number one, we make room for people no matter who they are, no matter where they've been. And number two... We embrace them. We don't just tolerate them. 1969, I was in second grade, so you can figure out my age. I'm 50. 
1969, I was in second grade, and I had a very best friend. His name was Everett. Everett was the coolest kid in second grade. He was as cool as a second grader can be. Because most second graders, they're, they're nerds, right? I was a nerd. I was painfully shy because I, I stuttered, and I had trouble making friends. I know it's hard to believe now, right? But Everett became my friend. Every day we went to recess together. Every day we worked with one another in our homework. And one day, uh, as we did every day, we went out to where the buses were. And we met his bus out in front of our school. This one day was different. When we got to Everett's bus, uh, there were people holding picket lines, or picket signs, and they were screaming at Everett. Did I mention Everett was black? He was the first black kid in our all-white school in Nashville. He was my very best friend, and I saw someone spit on Everett. To this day, I'll never forget that. You know why they did that? Because he was different. And it took a long time for people to embrace this little boy because he was different. There were even people in the class that tolerated him being in the school, tolerated him being in their class, but they never really befriended him and wrapped their arms around him. Church, if we want to reach into this black box, we have to put our prejudices away, we have to put our pride away, and we have to say, whoever you are, wherever you've been, whatever you've done, we love you. We love you because you're valuable to God. We want to embrace you. And then you go outside the box, and this is what we do to prepare this box. We make room, and we start learning to embrace people rather than to uh, just tolerate people. And then outside the box, we realize that the Apostle Paul had a method for reaching into the black box, and we should follow that same kind of method. If you read in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, the Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Now look at this next line. He says, First to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Now, you've probably read that a million times. you never really thought about what that means. Here's what he's saying. I have an evangelism plan. I have an outreach plan. I have a way that I go about bringing people from the black box into the red box. His way was he went to the Jews first. He went to the people who were a lot like him. You don't believe me? Turn to Acts chapter 17. We'll throw that up on the board. Acts 17 verses 1 and 2. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis, is that right? I think, and Apollonia, I think I read those right. If not, we'll just make it up and pretend we know what we're saying. And they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue. Where, where did the Jews meet? They met in synagogue. Here's what he was doing. Paul was going into a strange territory and into a strange land, and the first thing he did is he found people who were just like him. Or were very, very similar to him. Those were the people in the synagogue. Paul was a Jew. He was a Jew of Jews. And so he went into the synagogue and he found these people that were very similar to him. And so those were the people that he reached out to first. If we're looking for an intentional method, guess what we need to do when we're looking in the black box? Let's look at the people in the black box that are very similar to us. I'll give you an example. We, we have a class in this building that did something recently that I think is just Awesome. They got together as a class, either as a class or a small group, I don't remember which it was, but they got together as a class and they made up these packets for the homeless. And what they were doing is they were carrying these packets in their car and you come across a homeless person or someone standing at an at a intersection and you had this ready, you handed it to them, it had a lot of supplies, a lot of things in there that would be very useful to someone who did not have a home. And, and I commend them on doing this, I think it's great. But we need to realize that there's a difference between benevolence and outreach. That's benevolence. That's doing something kind for someone. Outreach goes another step. What would happen if we decided that in your small group or in your adult class or whatever you did, you decided to do something very similar to that, but instead of just stopping there, you found someone who was very much like you that has an interest in serving other people. They don't necessarily have to do it to the church. They don't necessarily have to believe. They just have an interest in serving other people, and you invite them to be a part of that one thing. Guess what you've done? You've brought them into our group. And from there, you have an opportunity to show them the love of Jesus Christ 
you have the opportunity to develop a relationship with them and to move them from one spot to the next because you've allowed them to enter into and be embraced by our group. Then what? Fine, he found people that were just like him. Then he found people that were very different from him. Now, if you look at the people in this black box, there are going to be people that are very different from you. And if you read the way the Apostle Paul worked, he worked in two ways. He worked through providential relationships, and he worked through providential circumstances. I want to encourage you to do this. If you have the courage to do it, I want to encourage you to do this. Go home and pray that God will put you in the way of somebody in the black box. That there's somebody in your life that you can build a relationship with, somebody in the black box. I want to encourage people in your small groups, pair up in families and find another family that may be in one of these boxes, whether it's the de church box or the unchurch box, and attempt to build a relationship with those folks. Because providential relationships are what bring people into contact with the Lord's church. It was through relationships that the Apostle Paul built these churches in, in Ephesus, in Colossae, Philippi. He went through these providential relationships. And the next thing you have to understand is there are providential circumstances. God will place you in a unique and amazing circumstance, whether it's in the life of someone else or in your own life, to where you can connect with people who are very much, actually absolutely not like you. So we have to have an intentional method. Let's look for people that are very similar to us and let's bring them into our group. Let's look pe for people who are different from us through these providential uh, relationships, these providential circumstances. Have an intentional method. The Apostle Paul did. We should too. Second thing I want you to see is that the second rule of engagement is that we need to embrace a catalytic motive. When I first came to Chattanooga, I came as a manager for AT&T. Uh, I, I was heading up a group of men who uh, basically they installed and maintained high-speed digital networking. I know that means nothing to most folks, but that's what they did. Now, when it came to productivity and, and all the things that they would measure this group on, they were dead last in the company when I came here. They didn't tell me that when I came here, by the way. They, they hide those things from you so that you'll take the job. They were dead last in the company. And so I decided I'm going to go out with these people and I'm going to find out if they even know what they're doing. These guys were great at their job. You know why they were dead last? They had forgotten why they did what they did. It's one thing to know what to do. It's another thing to be motivated to do it well and to push yourself. You know, as a church, this rule of engagement, number one, man, we've got to have a method. We need to know what to do. Number two, we have to have something that is going to create change in our life that will motivate us to do it. And there's two ways to do this. Uh, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. The first thing that will really motivate us, and there's two things that really motivate us, is that we go back to the original reason we wanted to be a follower of Jesus. And what is that? Because he loved us so much that he would rather die than live without us. It's the love of Christ that compels us. It motivates us. The second thing I want you to see is not just this love of Christ motivating us, but we need to understand that another motivation is that we believe and we act on this belief that Jesus Christ is the only hope for mankind in this world. Jesus is the only hope for our friends. He is the only hope for our community. And he is the only hope for our nation. That we believe that Jesus is the only hope, the best hope for all mankind. And we're willing to act on that. It reminds me of, of the book of John chapter 6. Jesus is having this, this conversation. He's, he's teaching some really hard things. He's talking about the Lord's Supper and that they would eat of his body and drink of his blood. And, and you go down through there and there were a lot of people that they heard his teachings and they just couldn't deal with it. 
And many people left Jesus at that time. And in verse 66 through 69, there's this discourse that takes place where Jesus turns around and he, he looks at his disciples and says, are you not going to leave too? And Peter, of all people again, says the exact right thing. Here's his response. I'll paraphrase it. Where are we going to go? Only you have the words that, are eternal, that lead to eternal life. Here's what he's saying. Why would we leave you instead of work harder for you? Because we understand you're the only hope. You know, if we want to prepare the red box to reach these people, if we want to prepare, prepare our hearts to reach people outside of Christ, we have to realize that it's the love of Christ that's going to motivate us. And that he loves them just as much as he loves us. And number two, we have to realize that he is the best hope, the only hope for this world. If you saw a blind man wandering through Hickson Pike, would you stop and help him out of the road? I'm not going to ask you to shake your head, but I believe you would. And we have all these friends, all these people, even people that aren't friends yet, they're wandering through this life and they just don't know the one who is the only hope. And when we think about the fact that if they don't reach him, they'll be forever lost and forever separated. We become motivated. We're motivated because God loved us so much and because he's the only hope. This third rule of engagement Talk about motive, we, uh, we've talked about method. I want us to develop an opportunistic mindset. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. We are therefore ambassadors, Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. What does it mean to be an ambassador? You ever thought about that you're Christ's ambassador? We're his representative in this world. Not only that, we're his partner in the work. Everything that we do should be done because it's in Christ and his church's best interest. And so we have to develop an opportunistic mindset. We will never reach people in the black box unless we intentionally look for them. Unless we're looking for opportunities uh, to reach out to whoever these people are, we'll never reach them. Now, if we look at this scenario, and I'll put this box back over here. We look at this scenario and we say, okay, just 20% of all the people are part of church. The rest of them aren't. We can look at it in two different ways, and they're very different. We can either look at this and we can say, man, that's horrible. Only 20%? And then we pull out the green cup. If you remember the green cup, there's a very small percentage that are people are much like us. Just that little bitty group of people? Man, the world's going to H-E double hockey sticks in a handbasket. Now we can look at it that way. And we can be all negative. Or we can look at it this way. I've created a target. And we're going to pretend that you're an archer today. And you're going to try and hit this target with a bow and arrow. And you look at the target, the bullseye on this target is a little bitty green dot because those are the people who are just like us. And then the next part of that, a little further out, is the red, and that's the church people. And then the further out than that is the black. Now, if we're a church that is just for church people and we're just about attracting people who are just like us, and that's our target, if you look at this target, it's going to be really, really hard to hit. How many of you think you could hit that target in three tries with a bow and arrow? Ain't a soul here that could do it. Unless you're like a, an Olympic archer or something, you're not going to do that. And, and see, people that have a mindset that this is a really bad thing and we just want to huddle up and be with people just like us, that's their target. They're trying to reach out to people who are just like them and to bring green cup people into green cup situations. Show the next target. That's the real target. We're told to go into all the world and to make disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe, to observe all that I commanded you, as he slurred that out. That's the target. You see that big black thing in the middle? 
I dare say everybody here could hit that target. And here's what I'm trying to show you. If we create an opportunistic mindset, and instead of looking at this and saying this is really bad, we say, we live in a target-rich environment. Look at all the people that we have an opportunity to influence. Look at all the people that we have an opportunity to share. And to realize that that's our target. What's going to happen if we have a method and we're motivated by the power of Jesus Christ, we're going to hit that target. We're going to reach those people. This is good news because there are so many people that need to hear a life-changing message about a life-changing Savior. Here's where the rubber meets the road. We must prepare the red box to receive people from these groups. That's what we're going to be doing in 2013. We're going to continue to prepare this red box and we're going to continue to reach out to the black box. Hopefully you can follow that scenario. We're going to prepare ourselves to receive others. The question is, do you think you can do it? I, as you know, I love video clips. Last week I showed a video clip from a movie called Freedom Writers. I want to show you another clip from that same movie. And when I show a clip from a movie, I do not endorse the movie. It is up to you to decide whether or not you want to watch this movie. However, this clip is, is a pretty amazing clip. It's a, this teacher, Erin Gruel, had this group of students that had come to her her freshman year, or their freshman year, and they were functionally illiterate, they were gang members, they were multiracial, multicultural, and it was her job to kind of bring them together and teach them literature. She taught them so much more than that. In this particular scene, she had brought in uh, a woman who, as a child, was a member of the family that had hidden Anne Frank. And you may be familiar with the diaries of Anne Frank, and Anne Frank was taken by the Nazis during the Holocaust. She is discussing what happened the day Anne Frank was captured. And the response is amazing. If you'll, if you'll roll that. The bounty on a Jew was about $2. Someone desperate for money told the Gestapo. On August 4th, they stormed into my office and a man pointed a gun at me and said, not a sound, not one word. And the soldier there took out his gun and put it against my head. You could be shot for hiding a Jew or go to camp. So another soldier recognized my accent. He was Austrian and so was I, uh, but I had been adopted by a Dutch family. So he told the soldier with the gun to let me go. There isn't a day that I don't remember August 4th and I think about Anne Frank. Yes? I've never had a hero before, but you are my hero. Oh, no. No, no, young man, no. I, I am not a hero. No, I did what I had to do because it was the right thing to do. That is all. You know, we are all ordinary people. But even an ordinary secretary or a housewife or a teenager can, within their own small ways, turn on a small light in a dark room. Yeah? If we indeed want to be church rather than just go to church, if we indeed want to reach people that no one else cares about or people who have been hurt 
or broken. I can promise you it's not going to be easy. I can promise you there will be danger. I can promise you that it will be messy. But sometimes in life, you do things simply because it's the right thing to do. And that's what this woman said. She didn't hide Anne Frank because it was easy. She didn't reach out to this little girl because it was convenient. She did it because it was right. When we start thinking about being the church and that the church was intended to be built strong and to do amazing things, I want to encourage you that as you develop your method and you think about your motive, that you understand we reach out to people because it's right. We reach out to these people because it's important. Because Jesus is the only hope for our friends and for our community and for this world. Let's pray together. God, you're an awesome God. We pray that we will be a church that truly turns the world upside down in the name of your son, Jesus. We know that you intended for the church to be built strong, and we know that it has outlasted all the ones who killed your son. The Roman Empire put him on a cross, and the Roman Empire is no more. The Jewish Empire convicted him, but the Jewish Empire is no more. But we know that Christianity prevails even to today. And it's not because we're good people, but it's because you are an amazing God. Our prayer is that you'll work through us to do what's right because it's right. To bring people into a life-changing relationship with your son because he's our only hope. Strengthen us and guide us in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I know that in this crowd here this morning, there are people who are coming back to church for the first time in a long time. There are people here who have are really never been a part of a church family. There are people here who are considering whether or not you want to be a part of this red box, whether you want to be a part of this family, this, this uh, group that calls themselves the church. We believe that you begin your journey with Jesus Christ through being buried in baptism with Jesus and raised to walk in newness of life. We believe as a church that we're going to own this mission of reaching out to the world. And we want to begin with you. If you love the Lord and you hadn't taken up your cross to follow him, if you haven't been buried in baptism, we invite you to do that. If you desire the prayers of the church, whatever reason it may be, if you just want to come home, we love you. We care about you. Also, our elders will be in room A5 and 7 across the hall. If you'd like to be ministered to them individually, they love you, they care about you, and they, they want to minister to you as well. Whatever your need is and however we can help you, we invite you to come while we sing together. My heart will sing no other name. Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing no other name. Jesus, Jesus. I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world.